you practice the Dharma, you're taking on a new culture. It's not Asian culture. It's what the Buddha called the customs of the noble ones. Because even in Asia, when people are practicing, if they're really serious about the practice, they have to go against a lot of the, the customs that they grew up with. We tend to think of the, the forest tradition as embedded in Thai culture, and to some extent it is. But it's good to remember that when John Mun was starting out, he was often attacked, criticized for not following Thai customs. He didn't live the way most Thai monks lived. He didn't eat, he didn't dress the way most Thai monks ate or dressed. And when people would criticize him to his face, he'd say, I'm not interested in Thai customs or Lao customs or customs of any country, because those are the customs of people with defilements. They're not the customs that lead to awakening. You want to define the customs of the noble ones and live by those customs so that you can become a noble one as well. This is a tradition that goes way back. One of the traditional stories in the commentaries of the Buddha returning to his home after his awakening, the very first day after he got there, in the early morning he went out for alms. His father, a noble warrior, was very upset because nobody in their family lineage had ever done anything like this. So he went out to criticize the Buddha, and the Buddha said, I'm not a member of that lineage anymore. I'm a member of the lineage of the Noble Ones. And this is one of the customs of the Noble Ones, is to go for alms. It's important that we think about this as we practice, because a very large part of our mind, a very large part of our habits, comes from the customs we grew up with. And we live in a society where the customs are based on defilement. So much of the, the mass media, so many of the books and ma <coughs> magazines, TV shows, movies, are aimed at increasing our defilements. And so much of our conversation with other people falls in line with those influences our interactions with other people are colored by these views, by these values. And so there comes a point when you're practicing the Dhamma, you realize that your values are different. You've stepped out of society a bit. You've stepped out of the dominant culture. And it's a question of how to still live in that culture, how to negotiate the relationship. And the basic phrase is, as they say on those Christian decals, not of this world. You live in the world, but you're not of the world. In other words, your value is for yourself. Your attitude about what you're going to do and what you're going to say has to stay in line with the customs of the noble ones. And you have to protect that part of your mind, protect that part of your practice. Don't allow anybody to make inroads on it. There are basically four values. The first three have to do with contentment. Contentment with whatever food comes your way, contentment with whatever clothing comes your way, contentment with whatever shelter comes your way. Learning to have a sense of enough, that you don't need all that much in order to be happy. The fourth principle has to do with discontent. 
that you take delight in developing, you take delight in abandoning. And here, of course, it means developing skillful qualities of mind and abandoning unskillful ones. Developing skillful words and deeds and abandoning unskillful ones. Seeing that there's always room for improvement. Or at the very least, making sure that you don't lose whatever qualities you already have. And it's not just that you follow these values. The Buddha adds that you have to see the dangers of being proud about this. We're not doing this to make ourselves better than other people. We're doing these things because we see that our minds are suffering. And the dominant values of the culture are not helping. They're increasing our suffering. So you have to have a sense of independence. You have to have a sense of self-reliance as you maintain these values. Keep your perspective on the fact that you're doing it because the mind has its illnesses. The mind has its diseases, and you need to treat them. So you don't make a show of your practice. You do it quietly. Then you have to internalize as much of the Dharma as you can. This is where the concept of refuge comes in. On the one hand, we're taught to take the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as our refuge. You always try to keep them in mind. The word sarana, refuge, also means something that you remember, something you hold in mind. For instance, we hold in mind the, the life of the Buddha. As we live our lives, there's always a narrative that we're patterning our lives on. Someone we may have admired when we were young, or just sometimes we just fall into the typical narrative. But it's good to keep the Buddha's narrative in mind as well. Someone who could have spent his life immersed in sensual pleasures, but he didn't. He could have spent his life in self-torment, extreme asceticism, but he didn't. Instead, he found the middle way, led to true happiness inside, a deathless happiness, happiness that doesn't depend on any conditions at all. And he did it not because he was some special divine being. but because he took the issue of happiness really seriously, and he developed whatever qualities of mind were needed. So you want to keep that fact in mind, so it keeps your life in perspective, the narrative of your life. Similarly with the Dhamma and the Sangha. There is a path of practice. And the Sangha, the Noble Sangha, shows that it yields results. And the Noble Sangha is not just monks and nuns, there are a lot of lay men and lay women. Who followed the Dhamma and found that what the Buddha said was true. So in taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, you're trying to keep these things in mind. So as to keep the issues of your life in perspective, what's important, what's not important, where you can make compromises, where you can't. But the refuge becomes true only when you can internalize it. And this is why those customs of the noble ones are really helpful. The more self-reliant you are in terms of being able to make do with whatever food, clothing, and shelter come your way, the less you're worried about how people think about you. 
how you look in the eyes of other people. And it gives you perspective on the work you would take to make your living. You just need enough in order to be able to practice. And most jobs that go beyond that also take a lot of time and a lot of energy, make it harder to practice. So there's a trade-off. And then you look for your sustenance in terms of the qualities of mind you can develop. You learn how to feed, as the Buddha says, on rapture. He says, like the radiant gods, develop good, strong concentration. We should compare it to rice, beans, honey, butter. Good food for the mind. The more you can feed your mind on these qualities, the easier it is to live with less and less outside, which makes you have a smaller footprint. You're a lot more self-reliant. There's a greater and greater sense of independence. Once I was teaching a retreat, helping to teach a group retreat, and one evening after giving a talk, one of the retreatants went back and he, as he told me the next morning, he found he was really angry with me. I told him about it the next morning and I said, oh, what, would, what made you anger, angry? He said, well, all that time you've been here, I've never been able to figure out where your buttons are. And so I said, well, that's why we wear robes. And I meant that in two ways. One, you can't see my buttons because they're all covered by the robes. But secondly, by wearing robes, I have fewer needs in terms of clothing. Because I have fewer needs, I have fewer buttons that people can see that they can push. But this principle doesn't apply just to monks, it applies to lay people as well. You keep your needs to a minimum. You're less tied to what other people think about you or want out of you, because you want less out of them. So the customs of the noble ones are customs of self-reliance. Customs of independence. Because after all, we're looking for freedom, and it doesn't come only at the end of the path. We try to find what freedom we can on the path as well. Because freedom means responsibility, it means the need to be self-reliant. Unfortunately, we don't have to keep reinventing the Dharma wheel every day. We do have the example of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha to give us guidance, to give us support. As we internalize their example, so that the mind really can become its own refuge. The self is its own mainstay. It become, become its mainstay when it's well trained. So as long as you need outside help, keep looking to the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha for your inspiration, for your support, for your nourishment. And provides you with the environment you need in order to keep your keep your values straight. Keep your priorities straight.
so the customs of defilement don't overwhelm you. And don't eat away at your practice. I mean, it's bad enough that you've got defilements in your own mind. But you want to be able to resist as much as possible the influence of defilements from outside, the things that feed defilement from outside, regardless of what the dominant culture says.